Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode, and I'm so excited. We have today's guest. His name is Dr. Guillermo Ruiz. Did I say it right? Nailed it. Oh, good. And he's from Arizona, and he is passionate about naturopathic practices, and he does all kinds of issues, autoimmune, hormone balance, thyroid, heavy metal, infectious diseases, all the things we love to talk about. And he practices medicine and integrative health that's in, in Arizona with Dr. Alan Christensen. And he does a podcast called 3030 Health. And he just wrote a book. Tell us about it. So, you know, uh, uh, well, Dr. Alan Christensen just wrote a book called The Metabolism Reset Diet. And uh, he's doing the podcast rounds. Uh, you know, I love my job. I love, you know, helping people. And I, I, when I tell people what I do, it's like I'm describing my dream job. That, you know, back in uh, 2008, 2009, when I started discovering this functional medicine and, uh, you know, how to eat better and, and uh, all of this paleo things, you know, uh, I kind of like imagined, you know, what if there was a profession where I, I wasn't, you know, uh, uh, restricted by what uh, the insurance company told me to do. And I could sit down with my patients and actually ask good good questions, get a good history, and address the underlying cause of their problems. Um, turns out that that's naturopathic medicine, you know, and, and, and it sounds like this medicine from the future, but it's like the way we used to practice. So what kind of doctor were you, what kind of doctor were you before you teamed up with Dr. Christensen? So I used to work at a level one trauma center as an EMT. So I, ever since I was a little kid, you know, four or five years old, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor. I just didn't know what type of doctor because when I went to the emergency department, I wanted to see if I could, if I had the, you know, the, the, the metal to, to do uh, care, you know, and what I saw was pretty amazing stuff, you know, in the emergency department, you know, you see. It's uh, grueling. And, yeah, it's grueling. And, yeah, it, but you also see the dark side of conventional medicine. You know, you also see that people come in and it's, uh, oh, you have this, here's your medicine. You have this, here's your medicine. Five minutes, next. Um, and I wasn't satisfied with that. I didn't think that that if, if you couldn't put a prescription or cut into someone, then that said, you, you know, you, you're going to suffer with this for, for the rest of your life. And, and then, you know, in the emergency department, you're able to treat these this injuries or these catastrophic things pretty efficiently. But when it comes to actually helping people with chronic disease, that's not the place for it, you know. Uh, and, and I wanted to have continuum of care. I wanted to see how things panned out. And I wanted to actually help people. So, so I, I was listening to Chris Kresser's podcast. And he's the first person that said naturopath. And I was like, what the hell is this? So I started looking into it and it was exactly what I envisioned. So, so naturopathic medicine found me, not the other way around. Wow. Well, I'm so excited because you told me that you are going to give our listeners a free giveaway. You're going to give away an ebook and a copy of Dr. Christensen's new book. Talk about that ebook for just a second. So one of the biggest things that I've seen in my practice is how um, misdiagnosed iron diseases are. You know, how many people, you know, that are listening have been diagnosed with anemia? And let's talk a little bit about that. What is anemia? And I think most people are not diagnosed and they have it, right? Is that what you're saying? It, it's twofold, okay? They tell them, you have anemia. And, and you have no concept of what that means, okay? Or, or B, your labs might look within the range, but, but iron is so important for so many different processes in your body that just being in rage is not enough, okay? So, so let's talk about what is anemia first, okay? okay. So anemia, anemia is the inability of your blood to deliver oxygen to your tissues, Mm. Okay, so so that's like a big concept. So basically, you can cut your finger and you start like bleeding all over the place. Your blood volume lowers, and you're gonna have anemia because you're bleeding out. Okay. Okay. 
you can have iron deficiency anemia, which is the one that we kind of think about whenever someone he, he, uh, hears you have anemia. And that's when you don't have enough iron in your blood cells to carry oxygen to your, to, uh, in, in your red blood cells to carry oxygen to your body. And what does oxygen do? Well, oxygen helps with producing ATP in the mitochondria. And everyone knows how important the mitochondria is. So if you're not taking those little molecules of oxygen into the cell, you're going to have fatigue. You know, mm -hmm. uh, another type of anemia is like a B12 deficiency anemia or pernicious anemia. Um, you can have megaloblastic anemia, and that's when your red blood cells are not dividing efficiently because MTHFR uh, mutations or because you don't have enough folate or B12. And now these big red blood cells get stuck in your tiny capillaries all over your body, and now they're not delivering uh, oxygen. So, so, so let me ask you this. So, so I got my, my blood work done and my iron levels were low, but they were still in the range, but my ferritin levels were, weren't even in the range. They were so low. So, yeah. so what does that mean? That means that, you know, in the conventional model, and this is like the difference, you know, this is like the, the, uh, the, the wow moment, okay? In the conventional model, that means that you're going to take a little red pill that is going to make you constipated. It might work, it might not. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that, you know, in the functional medicine uh, world, we need to figure out why is your ferritin low? Ferritin is the storage form of iron. Okay, so, so you have the iron that you're u utilizing on a day-to-day -day basis, and then you have ferritin, which is like our stock, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and as you so like if you had to give an analogy, would you say like, like iron is the money you have in your pocket, but ferritin is the money you have in your bank? Would that be a good oh, analogy? Yeah. That would be perfect, yeah. And, and you don't want, you know, uh, you don't want to deplete your bank account. You know, because the, you, we are constantly making big purchases, you know, like, for example, uh, if you if you're still cycling, you know, once a month, you're going to have to get a bunch of iron because you're going to lose some blood. Right. Um, or, 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 you know, uh, if you're exercising, you know, and, and, and you're trying to, uh, you know, you increase your blood volume, you're going to need that iron in order to create, you know, more, more red blood cells and be healthier. Um, and iron is not only used, you know, we, we've talked about one thing about iron, you know, how it's used in, in oxygen and in transportation. But iron is also used in your thyroid. It's how we uh, de-iodinize de the thyroid, the T4 to T3, T3 being the most uh, important, uh, the, the most active form of thyroid hormone. Uh, it, uh, iron is also uh, a, um, used to oxidize, like literally oxidize bacteria and viruses. That's one of the ways that our immune system fights infections. So if you don't have iron, now you have all of these different things that are affected. And that's why it's so important to have good mm -hmm. iron levels. So, so um, you, you know, uh, you, you wanted to, you want me to make a, like a distinction between iron and ferritin, you know? So your iron levels are gonna be pretty well regulated by your body because iron is just so important, okay? But if your ferritin levels start to decrease, something's going on. So what are some possible things that are going on? that of why someone's ferritin levels would be low and why would someone's iron levels be low? Okay, so so um, in, like in the in the different examples that we made, you know, like we talked about like, okay, maybe you're bleeding, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be your finger, but you could have like an ulcer. You could have, you know, maybe some uh, some irritation in your in your intestines. Uh, and that's, that's a little bit more, um, uh, grape, you know, or more acute and things that we need to make sure that you're not bleeding out, you know. Um, but you could have your a hormonal imbalance. And, you know, since since you were, you know, I don't know, 14, 15, when you started, you know, your menses, up until, you know, you start, you stop cycling, you're shedding a little bit of blood every day. Oh, not every day, <laughs> once a month, you know, so you're, you, you're, you're losing over that big, uh, course of time and if you're having heavy periods which you shouldn't you know uh 
and and you 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 uh, losing a lot of blood every every 28 days that could co that could be the reason so taking that pill you know to get your iron levels to a good level might help the symptoms okay but are you fixing the underlying cause my favorite cause of iron deficiency uh, uh, anemia is infections you know chronic infections uh, can can give you low iron levels so the body is like super smart, you know, and, and if you have an infection, well, bacteria and viruses can use iron to, to replicate and to continue, uh, you know, dividing. And, and it's so necessary for life that they kind of leech off of you and start eating it away, consuming it. Okay. Well, what the body does is it hides iron from you in order to help you control because like oh there's an infection we need to help you control it okay so so the the body kind of hides it and if you start taking iron and you have a chronic infection you know what's going to happen that infection is going to go up because now you're feeding the bacteria or the virus mm -hmm. so with low iron levels uh re in relation to infections there's actually a, a medical term of, uh, for it it's called anemia of chronic disease uh if you have an chronic disease doing the iron supp supplementation is not the best way of going about it you know you need so what would you say to someone let's say somebody is just either low in iron or low in ferritin what would be your your first kind of suggestion of how to fix it so my first suggestion. Go eat a big steak. Go eat a big steak. <laughs> well, you, you, yeah, and that's so important, you know, because of the um, you know societal pressures that we you know we went through in the eighties, you know, and about the low fat stuff. Um, you end up having like this aversion to to meat, you know, and 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 I've seen a couple of my patients, you know, that that maybe they were in their twenties and uh, around that that period of time, they're like, I don't eat red meat. You know, and, and I just don't like it. It just doesn't, well, you know, that would be a very, very important, you know, thing to, to triage and make sure that, that that's not the reason you're iron deficient, you know, because of diet. Uh, or they'll say things like, oh, I eat a lot of spinach. Well, plant iron is very different than animal iron. Uh, the plant iron uh, is not attached to a heme molecule, and that heme molecule is what le lets it go through your, in through your digestive system and into your blood cells. So if you're just eating plant-based iron, it's not very effective at replacing this iron. Mm -hmm. um, if you have hormone imbalances where, you know, the reason why you're, you, you know, you're coming to see me and, and the reason... Uh, is because you have heavy periods or you know things like that. Well, that's easy. That's easy to address. Let's balance your hormones and make sure your iron starts to go up. Um, if you have an infection, if you're, if you're so, what kind of things? When you say you want to balance their hormones, what yeah. kind of things are you doing to balance their hormone? Are you doing like progesterone cream or what are you doing? It you know it depends. I I, I really gone shy about starting uh, women in like their maybe early thirties in uh, with HRT because yeah I, you know I, I want to save it as much as I can you know I want to I, I want to be able to to uh, start them unless it's like completely necessary uh, start in hormone replacement therapy around perimenopause. That's that's what that I, I, which I what is the age for that in your opinion? Um when you start having irregular cycles so there's a misconception that you can get uh like lab results and they'll tell you oh you're menopausal or you're not menopausal um uh, uh, is menopausal, that true or not that's, 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 true? that's not, true. not true yeah being menopausal means that you haven't had a period for a year oh wow okay that's, yeah so so the moment you you know if you start having irregular cycles uh, that's when you're okay, you know, you start counting and then the last period, if you go a year without a period, then, and uh, you, you're menopausal. But, uh, around that time, that's when I would start looking into hormones. So your body, okay. Regulates your hormones through the pituitary gland. Okay. And the pituitary gland, uh, kind of regulates your thyroid, your adrenals and your ovaries or testicles and guys, you know, um, and sometimes if 
your hormones are out of balance is because your thyroid is out of balance. So balancing mm. the thyroid can help you with your cortisol levels, which will help you with your uh, female hormone levels. Um, detoxification is uh, so important. So endocrine disruptors like, uh, like lead or mercury or cesium and things like that are important in that balance, you know, because your body tries to use this heavy metals and try to make, you know, tries to make like things with it and they don't fit and they're toxic. Uh, so, so then that kind of imbalances your hormones. And then a big one is um, getting rid of like excess estrogen. So having a good detoxification program to where you are getting rid of all the estrogen. So what, what kind of things get rid of excess estrogen? So one of my favorite uh, supplements uh, is uh, DIM. DIM, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a molecule that makes... Are you saying D-I-M, DIM? DIM. Yeah. Okay. I have not heard of that before. No. Uh, uh. So uh, it, it's, it's one of the, everyone listening to this should do DIM cleanse at least once a, uh, once a year where you do 30 days taking some good quality DIM, D-I-M, um, and it's, it's a very, very cool molecule. It's from the brassica family, you know, uh, so, so uh, things like cabbage and, and broccoli and things like that. And, it, and this molecule helps your liver make hormones more water soluble. So it's not directly affecting the way you produce hormones. It just lets your liver be more effective at detoxifying them. And when you detoxify these old hormones, then your body can process other things. So estrogen is a very heavy and a very nasty, you know, uh, thing to detoxify. And that's why when you take oral estrogen, like birth control or, or you know, the old uh, style of hormone replacement, uh, you can get blood clots and you can get all, you know, they say, oh, don't smoke and, you know, you're, in, you're risk for things uh, increase because it's so difficult for your liver to detoxify it. So by taking them, you're helping your liver detoxify and, and kind of clean up things. Uh, so, so get rid of, you know, uh, uh, plastics, you know, don't microwave things in plastic. Uh, use, use either, you know, stainless steel or, or um, glassware. Yeah. I know on drchristiansen.com, you guys have lots of different, um, you know, things like protein and fiber and just some different things. Do you have that DIM on your website? Is that a sup supplement you have there? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, we, we have our own version of DIM. So we, ha we actually, you know, I'm, we're, like, I'm so into detoxification of the liver, especially of old hormones, that we have two types of DIM. We have DIM detox which is just the dim, clean, uh, and I use that more on guys. And then, and then we have like a, our extra special dim for women it's called Estro Reset. And it has some herbs and it has uh, calcium uh, D-gluconerate and the dim and, uh, to help you not only balance your hormones with, the, with, with things like the Vitex tree, it also helps you eliminate some of this old dim. So that's, mm. that kind of, you know, balances out. So, you know, we're so, we're always trying to detoxify. So we have those two products to help people in different ways. Mm, awesome. Well, I know that you had done a lot of work with Paleo FX and we have a lot of listeners who eat Paleo um, just because of different autoimmune and hormonal issues. Is the Paleo diet something you're passionate about for everyone? Or are you kind of like, listen, you know, if you've got these issues, you should be eating paleo. What, what's your opinion on that? So I came to this movement through the paleo diet, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and we don't know what the hell paleo means anymore, okay? So in, 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 uh, if you follow uh, influencers, you know, within the health space, you have, you know, I have seen people kind of like shed the paleo moniker and, and trying to go, you know, uh, follow a different, you know, trend or whatever. Uh, now keto is huge, you know, uh, in, in this, at, at, at this time. And, um, and I imagine that in four or five years, we're going to be talking about how people are shedding the keto moniker, you know? So mm -hmm. what is paleo? Paleo is the most anti-inflammatory diet for you. Okay. Yes. 
we use the name paleo because that's what's stuck, you know, but in reality, for example, if you have a person that has, you know, high blood pressure, extra pounds to weight, uh, to, to lose, uh, and uh, maybe type two diabetes, well, their paleo approach is going to be more low carb, you know, maybe, maybe uh, a little bit of calorie restriction, maybe some intermittent fasting, okay? If you have a high charging athlete that is doing CrossFit or, or just killing it in the, you know, doing jiu-jitsu or something like that, well, their paleo approach is going to be a little bit more high carb, maybe a little bit more, uh, more calories. If you have someone with an autoimmune disease, maybe they're going to do a AIP diet. So who's to say that all of these different things are in paleo? So what, where are you on your continuum of health and how can you get the most anti-inflammatory uh, uh, diet for you? So like, for example, if someone says kidney disease, um, maybe a high protein diet is not going to be the best thing for them. So who's to say that just because they're eating less protein and maybe they're getting their nutrition from things like bone broth and, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, carbohydrates that that's not paleo, that's totally paleo for them. So let's try to kind of see ourselves in our, in our continuum of health and make the decision that's going to be best for you. You have no iron, maybe you need a little bit more, uh, more liver. You have iron, you know, toxicity. Maybe you lay off and you start getting your iron from plants, you know. So it, it, it let's let's try to kind of identify our needs and, and then follow that diet. Yeah, I agree. Um, now, before we start getting into our listener questions, tell me about you. Like, I always like to ask my guests, like, walk us through the day in the life. Now, yesterday was the Super Bowl, so that might affect your answers for yesterday. But what did you eat yesterday? What would your diet look like yesterday? My goodness, I'm going to brag now because I, I did have a badass dinner. So uh, <laughs> there's this there's this company uh, here in Phoenix called Little Miss Barbecue. And it's like the second best bar- barbecue I've ever had, you know, number one being in Austin, Texas. And then this place is just like, you, you can Google it. Like the reviews are insane, you know, thousands wow. of years. So we actually bought a whole brisket. <laughs> so it's like eight pounds of brisket. And then there's another company. So, so it's really difficult here in, in Arizona to get uh, good seafood. Uh, and I'm from Florida. So I love seafood. You know, if I could eat seafood every day, all day long, that's what I would eat. Uh, so this, this restaurant called Chula makes a uh, smoked fish platter. So it had salmon, smoked salmon, uh, the smoked fish dip it had and this is amazing um vanilla pickled grapes uh, wow yeah no uh the homemade pickles homemade uh uh capers uh all of this like beautiful food so i completely fasted all day long just so i could just stuff my face with this delicious <laughs> Hey guys, we absolutely love getting your questions into the podcast, but we're also interested in your journey. So if you've started intermittent fasting and have some success or even struggling a little bit, we want to hear about it. Email me your intermittent fasting stories to Chantel at ChantelRayWay.com. All right, so this one is this question is from Shannon in Northern Virginia. We kind of answered a little bit of it. She says, I'm always trying to figure out what's wrong with me. LOL. My thyroid is functioning a lot better since I've been eating a 95% paleo and also fasting in about a six hour window. But I'm still feeling some of the symptoms that I attributed to my thyroid issues, like constantly being tired and constantly cold. My recent blood work showed my iron as being really low and borderline anemic. What do you think can be the root of my issues and what is the best way for me to improve my iron? Shannon from Northern Virginia. You know, a couple of things within this question, you know, first, first, uh, uh, first thing, you know, is like, oh, 95% paleo. <laughs> so let's help Shannon. Okay. You are 100% your paleo. <laughs> so if, if that means eating a little bit of grains, maybe some oats or whatever, that's your, that's your life. And if, if that's going to give you happiness and make it easy for you, you don't have to have that guilt that, that 5% is not being tended to. So that's your paleo. That works for you. You're, you're awesome. Okay. Second, 
um, fasting a six hour in, uh, uh, on a six hour window. Uh, when I was in school, someone said, hey, does anyone have um, a handout for fasting? And then someone said, yeah, I have a, a, a 12 hour fasting, a 16 hour fasting, a four hour fasting. And I was like, four hours? I think she means, I think she, she wrote on fasting in about a six hour window, but I think she means she's probably she's eating. eating in a six hour yeah. window, even though she wrote fasting. I yeah, think she's so, saying she's okay. eating in a six hour window. So unfortunately for women, fasting is not as good as for guys. Okay. Um, so if, if you are, if you are depriving your, your, your food window, um, your your hormone levels cannot decrease because you know think about it you know a guy you know our our whole in our reptilian brains what we want to do is reproduce that's like the 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 apex of our health how many calories does it take for a guy to produce uh you know uh, a load of sperm you know around 400 500 calories you know how many calories does it take for a woman to have a baby so if you're constantly inducing this artificial um, fasting or, or um, a period, you know, where you're decreasing your calories, your thyroid is like, okay, we need to do something to kind of slow you down in order for you to, um, to have the energy in the future to produce a baby. Okay. So I would, one of the things that I would recommend is that why don't you try eating three meals a day? You know, maybe for, I know I love fasting because it's, it's easy, it, it, it simplifies your life, but it can downregulate some of this thyroid hormones. And if you're having thyroid problems, maybe, maybe that's the reason your, your thyroid is not like 100%. Uh, as for your, you know, your borderline anemic, you know, that's exactly what we talked about. You know, you're not getting enough oxygen to your cells. So you're not getting good ATP production in your mitochondria. So I would do a couple of things. I would make sure you don't have a chronic infection, you know, something like dysbiosis or maybe, uh, you know, some, some of the weird viruses that you can hear, you know, EBV, CMV, uh, you know, things like that. And then uh, I would make sure that I replace my iron levels and work with someone that is savvy about doing both things at the same time, you know, making sure that if you have a chronic infection, that's not being lit up with, you know, because of the iron. Uh, so could the, the, the low iron be at the root of my issues? That's an interesting question because it could be that the iron deficiency could be a symptom of something underlying. So is it hormonal imbalances? Is it an infection? But definitely, if you don't have good iron levels, you're not going to get that ATP production. You're not going to get those energy levels that you're craving. Okay. This next one is from Anonymous. I have had three urinary tract infections in the past six months. I've been seeing someone new and heard that that can cause the infections, which made the first one explainable. But they keep coming back. Is there something... Is there such a thing as chronic UTIs or am I doing something horrible to my body that could be causing them? I feel like I'm spending the majority of my life going to the bathroom or in pain, anonymous. So, you know, UTIs um, are fascinating because uh, sometimes they are, they are recurring like this and, you know, chronic. Um, I had a patient that was, uh, you know, whenever they come to, to our clinic, we try to put them on natural desiccated thyroid because that's where we see the best results. You know, we see more quality of life. We see better uh, thyroid levels. Uh, the, you know, the T3 and T4 combination at a natural uh, ratio works really good. And my patient says, every time I go on natural uh, desiccated thyroid, I get UTIs. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Let's try it, you know. And sure enough, as soon as she started taking the, the natural desiccated thyroid, she started having UTIs. And I was wow. like, what the heck, you know? Uh, so, so the way that I see it, some of these uh, um, chronic UTIs uh, or uh, can cause like what's called interstitial cystitis. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. And that's when you're, when you're having like this irritation in your, in your bladder 
that causes pain and that pain causes irritation and that irritation can lead to an, a chronic UTI. I usually treat chronic UTIs like leaky bladder, you know, so the same um, type of tissues that are in your gut are, you know, the same type of tissues that are in your bladder, you know, this, this uh, uh, very uh, uh, expandable tissue that can get some chronic infections. Um, so I make sure to get a, I would make sure to get a good, uh, urine culture. Okay. So get a good urine culture, get, uh, uh, make sure they do some, uh, some speciation just to, just to make sure that, that, uh, that the, the, the bacteria that is found in, if, in your UTI is, um, you know, uh, is going to be affected by the antibiotic that you're going to take. So, so something like this can be has to be treated with antibiotics because you don't want to get a kidney infection. When it gets frustrating, if, if you do this culture and then it comes back as completely clean and they're like, oh, you just, it's all in your head. Well, no, there's a, there's a reason why you're having the symptoms. And then I would start with, you know, a, a little bit of glutamine. I would start taking, um, you know, some of these herbs that help um, create moisture in your tissues. And then I would do some D manos. D manos is this sugar that um, that it makes the tissue and the bladder more slippery. For uh, and then bacteria can't attach to the walls of the bladder. But you have to do D manos for a long time. You know, like 30, 60 days to kind of you know reinvigorate that bladder to try to get you know. Uh, some of this tissue, uh, you know, back into uh, normal. So, you know, maybe, you know, you started seeing someone new and, and that caused the initial infection. But, you know, taking the, the antibiotic should have gotten rid of that, of that uh, infection. Maybe you just have some chronic irritation to your bladder tissue and, uh, and getting a good protocol for rebuilding that, you know, those, those tissues is what's going to get you out of this spiral. So my opinion to her is I, I've actually only had a UTI, I think maybe once in my life. Um, but when one of my friends told me, they said, I'm going to tell you the secret to never getting a UTI. And she said, like, when you have sex with your husband, immediately, like the second you have sex, run to the bathroom and go pee. And so literally like, when she said that to me, I was like, okay, so like now I want to have sex with my husband. Literally, it's it's almost comical because like the minute we have sex, I'm like, okay, boom. Like I literally <laughs> run to the bathroom and go pee. And I will tell you, I have never had a urinary tract infection since I've, I've done that. And so that's my advice to her is that after you have sex, you run to the bathroom as fast as you can and go pee. <laughs> so, all right, here's the next question. This is from Madeline in Chesapeake. Everywhere I turn, I'm hearing about celery juicing. I remember you talking about it a few months ago, and since then, it's been such a trend. Can you talk about some of the benefits of celery juice a vegetable that I thought until recently was mostly water, and I can't ta stand the taste of the juice, but I don't mind eating it. Will I get the same effects if I eat the celery instead of drinking it? Madeline in Chesapeake. Well, with with celery juice, uh, it it is a trend right now. Uh, have you been talking? Because I I I'm not. You know, the the most important thing to detoxify is protein. You know, uh, and, and I remember when I was in school a couple of years ago, uh, when I, whenever I'd say, you know, oh, you want to detoxify, you need to eat some protein. People would like roll their eyes because that's not a green juice. Um, in reality, celery juice is just this juice that, you know, has some phytochemicals in it, uh, not super uh, uh, nutrition, not a lot of nutrition, uh, nutritional um, benefits from it. Uh, if you like it, you know, go ahead and, and drink it. But it, it, it's not this magic cleanse that is going to bind to metals and stuff like that. Uh, I know I know there's books out there that say that, you know, this this magical celery juice is going to cure everything. Uh, not a big fan of it. You know, looked into the into the literature on it and it is not not, not a lot of uh, literature on it. 
Um, it might be helpful if you don't, you know, if you don't drink enough water, you know, uh, and you're in a chronic state of dehydration. Uh, it might be helpful to have some uh, some celery juice because it does have a couple of minerals in there. One of them uh, is funny enough being silica. Silica is found in, in this type of uh, shoot like, you know, uh, vegetables. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't. I, I don't think that that if you don't drink uh, celery juice, you're going, you're you're missing out. I think that uh, the the liver needs things like um, uh, methionine, and it, it needs leucine, and it needs all of these proteins in order to perform at a good level. And and restricting your protein intake is probably one of the easiest ways of getting like. Uh, um, a leaky liver or, or getting a liver that is going to be congested. Mm. What about, what do you think? Um, for me, what, what I've heard is that the celery juice helps increase your stomach acid. And so one of the things that's, that's really important that I think people don't realize of how much your health is affected by poor digestion. Oh, hundred percent. And, and so you know, if it increases your stomach acid, a lot of these people are doing all these different things like that are lowering your stomach acid, which is bad. And so um, that is, for me, if it does increase your, your stomach acid, that that is a really good thing. I, I do drink what I do and and you're supposed to drink celery juice by itself with nothing else. Um, I drink a celery, a celery juice and a, some spinach juice in the morning. And just because I am low in iron and some other things, for me, it, it has helped me. Um, but like like she said, I don't know. I don't think it's the end all be all, you know. Yeah. But So, you know, one of the most important things, speaking of digestion, is that, you know, we're not taking time to chew our food. Yes. I'm so guilty of it. I'm so guilty. I'm the worst. I'm the worst. Five siblings. So if you didn't eat fast, you didn't eat, you know? Um, And uh, and then, you know, I have my, you know, my big thing of cold water uh, and you're drinking cold water, eating, you know, or like iced tea and, and, uh, and then you're lowering the, you know, the, 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 the heat, the, you know, the, the fire in your, in your stomach. And now you're not, processing those 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 proteins and breaking them down into amino acids so totally agree with you you know um getting some digestive enzymes is another way of increasing you know the the, that stomach fire um and then chewing your food again you know do as i say not as i do because i inhale food uh but yeah it's super important especially if you have autoimmune disease because if you're not breaking down those proteins, okay? And those proteins go through the leaky gut and then they encounter your new system. You start creating this uh, antibodies, you know, to these proteins. And then that can give you flare-ups for uh, on your, on your uh, autoimmune disease. So make sure you're sealing your gut, you know, eating good, uh, you know, stuff to heal the gut. And like you said, anything that increases your digestion is a good thing, you know? So, so, and the Japanese got it right, you know. They eat slow. They they have they they have some uh, some green tea, you know, and it's warm, so they're not that you know drinking cold, you know, half a gallon of cold stuff with their meals, and uh, and that can help you with your digestion. Anything that you can do for your digestion and, and increasing the absorbability of yeah. Food. The one thing I do now, the one thing I do now that I'm starting to do when I go to a restaurant, when they ask me what I'd like to drink, I say nothing. And I say, please don't bring me a water because I will drink it. And it really makes a huge difference when you're not drinking water. I used to drink, when my meals, I used to drink like three to four big things of of liquid, of water or unsweetened iced tea with my meal. And now I just say, thank you very much, but I will, I'll drink my water outside of my meals. But when I'm having my meal, I don't have anything to drink at all now. Have, have you ever done any apple cider vinegar? Right before my meal? Yeah. I haven't. I'm not, I hate the taste of it so much and I, uh, it's just like so awful, but I probably should. Are you a fan yeah. of it? 
So it, 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 again, anything that increases your uh, the, your ability to digest, and that's that's an old school uh, uh, you know method of of doing that. You know, or like if you if you like herbs, doing any bitter herbs uh, that you know. Uh, so things like um, in, uh, like a little bit of, of like oregano or things you know things that are bitter that that, uh, that can increase the acidity in your stomach. Uh, but you know digestive enzymes so easy, convenient. You can put them, you know, carry them with you. And if, if I'm having a big meal, I'm gonna take some digestive enzymes. Yep. All right. This next one's from Melissa in Fresno. One of my friends decided that she had her own home iodine test that she made up where she applied iodine iodine to my skin and she said if it all of the iodine soaked up on my skin that very quickly that that meant that my iodine levels were low. Iodine has never been something that's been on my radar as something I need to be concerned with. And now I'm like, great, that's one more thing I need to do. Why has my doctor never talked about this? And is this something I really should be worried about? What is the function of iodine and what are some ways I should get more of it? The most obvious is iodized salt, but there are so many mixed reviews on salt these days. Help, I'm confused. Melissa in Fresno. So I, I recently wrote an article on how iodine is one of the most misunderstood supplements out there. And, and it, it is really profound because, so let's start with uh, what does iodine do, okay? Iodine is super necessary for life. Uh, it, it, it's this molecule that has one use and the only use that it has is going to your thyroid and then binding to thyroglobulin. And anytime you hear globulin, think protein, okay? Globulin protein. So binds to thyroglobulin. And if you have four iodines in one, mo in, in one thyroglobulin, you have T4. And then if you have three, you have T3 and creates thyroid hormone. That's it. That's the only use for iodine that I can think of, you know. So then, uh, so then that, that little thyroid hormone goes around your body and it binds inside the nucleus of your cell and it helps that cell, you know, work. So whether, whether this cell is, you know, specializes in, in uh, creating a uh, protein that helps you um, think better or, it, or, or growing muscles or, you know, uh, create red blood cells. So every cell in your body is affected by thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is like the accelerator in your car. And if you don't have enough pressure on the accelerator, then your, your metabolism is going to be stunted, okay? So it's, it's a super important thing. And in iodine, the only thing that it does is creates thyroid hormone, okay? So, so that's what iodine does, okay? What are good levels of iodine? Well, if you have autoimmune disease, iodine can be like a fire on your thyroid and it can exacerbate your thyroid uh, disease. Okay, so I am very, very, very careful recommending people get, you know, take iodine supplements or, or um, even, even um, things like, like the iodine dropper. Well, this is, th it's funny that we got this question because probably her friend listened to our podcast. We, we had a lady on our podcast and she suggested taking Basically, what she said is take this Lugol solution, yeah. uh, which is iodine, and basically take it and you put it on your your arm. And she, she suggested that if you put it on your arm and you soak it in very quickly, that you need iodine. If it okay. takes a long time to do it, then uh, you don't really need it. Yeah. So, so this is where, this is where like, I am so happy to be in the, my field. Okay. And this is why this, this, this type of things is what like geeks the hell out of me. Okay. Because I went and looked at the research on this and they had, they had three samples, th three, three types of people. Okay. Uh, hypothyroid, euthyroid or normal thyroid and cadavers. Oh gosh. 
and uh-huh. they did the one inch, you know, uh, iodine, and there was no relationship on how much iodine that they needed. I, I, and I, I'm not talking out of, you know, you know, I'm going to send you the, the, you know, the study where they use cadavers. Cadavers have no use for iodine. Uh, and, and, you know, so we have all of these practices. Well, this is funny because when she, when she came on the show, I literally was like, okay, I'm going to go buy some. And I made everyone in my office, I said, okay, everyone, we're going to put iodine on you and iodine on you. And we're going to test it to see if you need it or if you don't. Totally. And, and it's like, it, it's like this old school thing that we're like, oh, you know, this, this is going to correlate to this. No correlation whatsoever. Like, for example, we're talking about, about digestive enzymes, old school people would say, okay, you take one with your meal. And if not, you take two and three and four. And if you, you take as many until you start feeling a little bit of like heartburn. And when you feel that heartburn, then you go one back. That's, you know, that can give you an ulcer. You know, so not because things are, you know, said or talked about or whatever, that doesn't mean that that's the best approach. So there are studies, okay, and I can, and I, I'm totally going to send you all these links because I want people to, to, to know that I'm not just being a contrarian or, or I'm just, you know, saying things that just to contradict other people. There are studies where, you know, when you have an ultrasound uh, to see if you have any nodules on your thyroid. Sometimes if the nodule is too big, they have to do a, what's called a pine needle aspiration. And the pine needle aspiration is to see if you have can, a cancerous nodule or not. Well, whenever they use iodine to dis- disinfect the thyroid before they do the biopsy, um, they are, there are studies that show a longer lasting hypothyroid state by using the iodine because your body is like getting a super infusion of iodine and the body goes like, okay, okay, we need to do something. This is too much gasoline in the fire. Let's shut down the, uh, the thyroid production. Like for example, the reason you take iodine pills if there's a nuclear disaster is because um, the, the thyroid is very receptive to uh, toxic uh, metals. Okay, because remember, there's only one thing that thyroid does, and it takes iodine and puts it into thyroglobulin to make thyroid hormone. Um, so if something kind of looks even like iodine, it's going to try to make thyroid hormone with it because it's just so important. So if you are in radiation, you know, if, if like a nuclear attack or, or I don't know if you've ever been at, uh, at an X-ray you know, facility and they always put on something around, around their thyroid, um, well, uh, you put it around your thyroid because it, your thyroid is like a sponge that is going to absorb all, the, all that radiation. So on nuclear attacks, okay, if, if a bomb was to fall, you know, around here, you know, like Fukushima, what people do is they take a huge amount of iodine. And the reason you take that huge amount of the iodine is to make that mechanism that blocks your iodine from uptaking, uh, your thyroid from uptaking more iodine happen. It's that wolf shikov reaction. And, it, you know, so it's so important to have good iodine balance because if you take excess iodine, it will shut down your thyroid. So mm-hmm. it, we have to be super careful with iodine um, even, you know, like applying that test or, you know, because you can make yourself transitionally hypothyroid by doing like that, uh, something like that. In fact, there are studies, and I will send you the study of how people reverse their Hashimoto's by doing an, a low iodine diet. So decreasing your iodine kind of got that, that, uh, that, that. So what are some foods, what are some foods that are high in iodine? So Things like uh, uh, dulce and, and uh, it, like algae, you know, like kelp, things that, uh, you know, are really high in iodine. Interestingly enough, dairy can be really high in iodine. And it's not because, you know, uh, uh, dairy is a natural source of high iodine. It's because uh, when they clean the udder, they use iodine before they put the little things. So some of that iodine goes into the, into the milk. Um, one last thing about how important iodine balance is. So back in the day, okay, in the Michigan corridor around Michigan, 
um, there was a lot of goiters, okay? And goiters can be caused by low iodine, okay? So you have low iodine, uh, and then that can cause your, your thyroid freaks out, and it starts growing to try to have as much uh, surface area to try to get as much iodine from your blood, okay? So that's why you see some people, you know, with, with goiters. So they, uh, they, they decided to put iodine on salt because that's something that everyone uses. And they did see some, some uh, decrease in, in, um, in goiters, okay? So around 1980, the Restaurant Association, okay, got together and they decided to take iodine out of restaurants, okay? Because people were injuring their, their thyroid because they were getting iodine with every meal. So kind of to make it like a balance, they decided, okay, people are going to do low iodine or deiodinized salt at restaurants. And then when they go home, they eat, they eat iodized uh, salt. That's why most restaurants have uh, zero iodine salt. It's, isn't it funny? The problem now is that people are going to restaurants so often that now they're not getting any iodine because they just eat out all the time. So it's like this crazy thing that happened. Okay, so I want to recap. I want to make sure I want to make sure that you just understand what I'm saying. I'm going to repeat back what I hear you say. So first of all, we all know iodine is an element that you need for the production of the thyroid hormone, yeah. right? So the first of all, the body doesn't make iodine. So it's an essential part of your diet. And we know iodine is found in all kinds of different foods. Shrimp is a good one, Um, some fish, stuff like that. But if you don't have enough iodine in your body, you can't make enough thyroid hormone. Correct. Correct? So um, iodine deficiency can cause, you know, you can have a an enlargement of the thyroid, you can have goiters, hypothyroidism, so forth. So um, now, so you just confused me for a second because you were saying, you were saying, okay, you might want to do a lower iodine diet. Is that what you're saying? For for people with Hashimoto's or people that have, um, uh, you know, autoimmune thyroid, you do want to do a low iodine diet, okay? okay. And the, the reason is because thyroid hormone has iodine. So anytime you take your thyroid pill, you're taking around 150 micrograms of iodine. So if you add more iodine, even through diet, that can sh- further shut down your thyroid. Okay, so you're saying if they're, if they're taking like even like armor thyroid or a natural thyroid, you're saying that has iodine in it already. Yeah. So then if you're eating a diet that has high in iodine, then you might be having too much iodine. Totally, and that shuts down your thyroid. Now, if you want to like look for a micronutrient to increase while you're, uh, if you have uh, hypothyroidism, I would concentrate more on iron. You know, iron uh, helps uh, convert T4 to T3. And then the second thing would be selenium. Selenium is super important uh, to, com- to make thyroid hormone. But yeah, I would stay away from iodized salt and I would stay away from uh, high iodine diets. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Tell people if they want to find out more about you or learn more about some of your blogs, uh, tell them where they can go to find out more about you. You can go to 3030 Strong. Uh, that's my website. And then my podcast is 3030 Health and I interview all sorts of people. You should come on my podcast. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, and uh, and then I write a lot for DrAlanChristensen.com. So if you if, like, for example, if you do iodine, Alan Christensen, you'll see all of the stuff that I talked about. If you can't wait until this podcast gets published, uh, and I'm gonna send you a couple of papers on that iodine thing. But yeah, so thirty thirty strong on all you know the social media platforms, Instagram, uh, Facebook, you know, uh, and and then my podcast, and that's the best way to uh, to awesome. listen to all my crazy ideas. 
Awesome. Well, it was such a pleasure having you. Thanks so much. And if you have a question that you want answered, go to questions at ChantelRayway.com. See you later. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.